Jesus. No, Yo, Paso, welcome. Bienvenido. Estamos. Déjame. Hola. Se llamó tu bienvenido a HIF. Hola. We're so glad you're here. HIF is one church with two locations serving over 50 nations. You're welcome to visit either Meeting or Westlake sites. While you're here, we hope you will connect with God and each other. Join a connect group in your area or interest to build friendships and build up your faith. Participate in our workshops to better be equipped to serve. Whether you stay for a short time or many years, leave a positive impact in the lives of others. Join a ministry team to serve others within HIF. Love the noise by loving the people at work and in your community. Participate in the outreach activity through our city partners network. When the time comes for you to launch out of Hanoi, it's our hope that you'll be better equipped to serve God wherever you go. Let's take a moment to look at our announcements. You can now enjoy your cup of coffee using your new HIF mugs. Yes, HIF mugs are available for sale. We have a mix of colors for you to choose from. Red, green, or blue. Please check it out at HIF Log. We love Hanoi. We love Hanoi because of its quaint beauty, rich history, and economic opportunity. But most of all, we love the people of Hanoi. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, and we can do so by loving our fellow Hanoians. Whether you are here for a short time or a lifetime, we encourage you to love the city and to contribute to community. Join the Love Your City seminar to learn more about the five steps of citywide movements, principles from the Bible for the city, posture of Christians towards the city, process for designing community projects, Partner because it is too big to do alone and people who make the city transformation possible. This seminar will give you a brief overview of my upcoming book, Love Your City, which will be released after New Year in 2020. Simultaneous translation into Vietnamese will be available during the seminar. So come on Saturday, November 2nd at 1.30 p.m. and be better equipped to serve and to love our city because we love Hanoi. HIF team has qualified for the finals. The tournament is a charity fundraiser organized by churches in Hanoi. It's amazing to see how a game can bring fun, love, and unity in building up the community of Christians right here in Hanoi. The final is at 8, so come out and support us. Amen. Amen. Here for our HIF football club. We from there last night to attend the, the semifinals. So close until the uh, penalty shots and HIF uh, kept one out of the goal. So we just barely made it, but we're playing against the finals against the team, uh, a non Christian team. So these are 15 churches, and one of the churches uh, recruited a team of their apartment building. And that apartment building now is in the finals also. So we're playing against them next Saturday. So come out, it's at the soccer field right by D-Tech Tower. It's very easy to find. And uh, so it'd be great if you come support us next week. Uh, next week, Sunday, after service here in Westlake, we will have a luncheon for those who are interested in being part of a new initiative to provide Christian higher education. And so we are... Uh, this is Union University of California. This is an online uh, university, primarily for uh, pastors to receive uh, theological degrees, but now they're expanding into the School of Innovation and Management, uh, wanting to attract a lot more students and also provide the touch point and relationships to share more with them as well. And so if you're interested in Christian higher education, you're welcome to join this luncheon. The email will go out, you can register for this lunch uh, that will take place after service next week. After service today, 
we actually have a baptism of one of our Chinese members, uh, actually flew in from KL, a family member of uh, one of our Chinese members who will be baptized today after service at 12 here in the, in the swimming pool right after service. So you can attend that as well. Anyway, welcome to HIF. And now you can have coffee in your HF mug. So they came out really nice. So I hope you get one after service. Uh, but welcome to those who are visiting with us today. If you are uh, a newcomer to Hanoi, a new resident, or a visitor, a friend brought you, we are so glad that you are here this morning and we want to briefly get to know you. So my name is Jakob. I'm originally from Holland and I plan to be in Hanoi indefinitely. God knows. <laughs> so, but uh, if you could share your name, where you're from, and how long you plan to be here, uh, even if God only knows, uh, you can uh, let us know. And so, if you're on this side, and this is your first time with us, would you stand up, and our usher will give you a uh, mic, and just briefly introduce yourself. And we have at the front here, and uh, Jim, would you introduce yourself? A lot of people don't even know you anymore. <coughs> Hi, greetings from Texas. Uh, I moved up to Hanoi 10 years ago, and uh, we moved away in 2017. I uh, dealt with cancer, but uh, I'm 500 days cancer free. Amen. I'll be here for uh, two weeks till the 25th, so uh, great to worship with you this morning. God bless you. I'm Claire, I'm from South Korea, and it's been a, a month I'm, since I came here, and it's so lovely to see you guys all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> a few more guests in the middle. If you would stand up. I'm Chad Hollowell, this is Greg and Julie Nicholson. We're from, I'm from the U.S. in Charlotte, North Carolina. Visiting uh, Jakob and uh, the church to the church of Christ tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else this side? First time visitor? Yes. Okay, how about on, uh, on this side? If you're here for the first time as a guest or a visitor? Good morning, everyone. This is not my first visit to your beautiful church, but my best friend Andre and I traveled many, many miles across the waters here to Hanoi. This is my fourth visit to Hanoi, so I am an official Hanoian now. <laughs> and I'm here, Andre and I are here visiting my daughter Vanessa and my beloved grandchildren Isaac and Ariana. And I bring you greetings from Quinn Chapel AME Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. Thank you. <laughs> Ohio, and as she said, this is my best friend. Mm -hmm. I'm visiting her family, and I am pleased to be here with you this morning. Well, welcome. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Leah. I'm from Paris. I'm in vacation here for two weeks, and I'm leaving today. Oh. And <laughs> Yes, but I saw your church on the internet, and I'm so happy to be there today. And I hope um, I will enjoy the service, but I already enjoy the worship moment. So thank you. Thank you. We all want to get on the plane to Paris with her, right? <laughs> Hi, good morning, church. Um, we're Vandisa, and... Mitchell, and um, we moved to Hanoi about uh, almost two months ago, and uh, we committed to be here for six months, and we'll see what God says from there. God only knows. <laughs> I'm born and raised in Dallas, Texas, but um, <laughs> Texas in the house. Um, but I've lived all over the U.S., and we were living in California before coming here. Great. Welcome. I'm Moses from India. 
I am not a new for HIF, but this is the first time I am visiting the Westlake branch. Yeah. Most frequently, I will go for Maidin branch. Yes. So I am working here in Vietnam. Almost I completed one year in Vietnam. So I just brought my family here for visiting Vietnam. Oh. So almost they completed. This is the last day for them in Vietnam. Yeah. So tomorrow they have the flight for India. Yeah. Welcome. My so family, my father, my mother, and she's my sister. visiting me here in Vietnam. I work here. I've been here several months and I'll stay till January. And they will now introduce themselves. <laughs> uh, I'm Mika from this. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm Willem from the from the Netherlands too. And he stays here for next week, Tuesday, we leave. Uh, well, good morning. Welcome. <laughs> I'm so glad that uh, all of you are visiting with us. For those moving on, have a good uh, journey back home or next destination. But we do have some who might be launching out. If you've been a part of HF for over six months and this is your last service, we'd like to pray for you. Is that anyone this morning? I think so. All right. Well. Want to dismiss our kids for a kids quest? So kids have a great time this morning, making friends and learning more about Jesus. And uh, while they go out, would you greet uh, those around you? Just say hello, get to know our uh, visitors. Yeah, yeah. sad to realize that do we not have any men serving with kids class so uh, so let that be an appeal for men join our kids quest team you know um, when I went to Bible school in New York my wife volunteered me to serve with the children's ministry and then she decided to join the youth ministry so for four years I joined the children's ministry now that's not my cup of tea so to speak I'd rather play guitar but um, I really enjoyed it. It was a great experience for me to work with the kids. And uh, so you, this doesn't have to be your comfort zone. It doesn't have to be something you're skilled in, uh, but uh, definitely is, I would like to challenge us men in the room uh, to consider being part of our Kids Quest team. So it's a really rewarding ministry. All right, let's, uh, let's pray. Uh, and before we continue service uh, with uh, Daniel, who will bring the message this morning. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you here this morning. We always count it a privilege that we can meet together from so many nationalities and visitors from across the world to worship you, Jesus, because you are worthy. You are glorious. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, and you have transformed our lives, and we want to transform the lives of others. Lord, and so thank you for this privilege to meet here in this location in the Hanoi Club and uh, Lord, for the favor that we have as foreigners and internationals to worship you here this morning. Lord, uh, we Lord, we confess, Lord, that we fall far short of, of your standards and expectations, your design and your intent. Lord, uh, we are not self-righteous, Lord. Uh, and so we confess our sins and our shortcomings. Lord, we know that we need Jesus Christ. 
to be in relationship with a perfect God who is holy and expects nothing less. But it's because of Jesus and his work uh, and death upon a cross that we have been given, forgiven for, from our sins, that we might have a relationship with God and call him Abba, Daddy, Father. Thank you, Lord. We have such an awesome God who went all the way to pay the price for us to be in relationship with us. And we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for, for, for that great gift of salvation, that great gift of relationship with you. Lord, and so it is our prayer uh, that uh, we would experience you and your presence throughout our lifetime, oh Lord, whatever life may throw at us. Lord, not only are we faulty, but our world is faulty and broken. Oh Lord, our, our bodies are faulty and breaking down as we get older. Lord, and we rejoice with uh, Jim this morning, his testimony of 500 plus days being cancer free, Lord. And that was such an answer to prayer. And yet at the same time, we know that many are going through trials and through physical suffering and not finding uh, this, this healing. Lord, and we pray that you, they will find you in the midst of that suffering. Lord, and as we today launch a new series about finding hope in the face of suffering, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and to our souls and that we might find you no matter our circumstances. Lord, and we pray for Jim and April as they uh, have had to change gears so many times over the past few years and even now and again, Lord, we pray that you would bless them and their family and their two sons, Lord, that you would uh, settle them in Texas and take care of uh, the parents, Lord. Uh, Lord, uh, it's a different stage of life and we just pray for your grace and your mercy uh, to be new for them each morning. Lord, and we pray for others who are going through difficult times in HIF, whether it's at the workplace or in relationships or with health or trying to make decisions about their future or even figuring out why am I here, Lord? Why am I here in Hanoi or on this planet? I pray that you would speak to each one of them in each of their circumstances. Lord, we pray for our women's retreat coming up next week. Lord, that the women would just have a real blessed time together, building genuine relationships, worshiping uh, Christ as the center, Lord, of their community, Lord, and as well that you would continue the transformational work that you have begun in each of their lives. Lord, that they would come back with greater uh, excitement and a greater depth of knowing you and knowing one another. Lord, we pray for our city, Lord, and we know it's been a, a real concern of everyone in our city, government, citizens alike, of the environment. We pray for your wisdom for our government, Lord, to manage this city well. Lord, it's so challenging. It's a developing nation, the fastest econ growing economy in Asia, and yet, Lord, how to put boundaries and limitations in that growth and upon that what is so-called development, Lord. I pray that you would bless Mayor Chung and uh, those who are serving with him in making the decisions on how to manage our environment better, Lord. And we do pray for HF's relationship with government. Lord, and as I meet uh, tomorrow with National Religious Affairs and the Hanoi Religious Affairs to share more about the vision for networking the churches together to bless and to love our city and to, to contribute to our society and to the community, Lord, I pray that you would give us more and more favor. Lord, that as they have studied the role of the church in society in Europe and across the world in history, I pray that you would also give us vision for the role of the church and society in the future. So we pray that you would give us favor. Lord, uh, we pray that you would bless Daniel as he comes to share the word this morning and launch this new sermon series. Pray that you would speak through him and through the psalm that you would touch our hearts deeply, whether it's for today or for someday in the future. We all will need your encouragement. We pray in Jesus' name. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I should probably introduce myself uh, while I get organized here. My name is Daniel Owens, and I am on the elder team. Although I'm embarrassed to admit 
this is my first time to visit Westlake. We really? moved here five years ago, and this is my first time, so I don't know what that says about me, but anyway, <laughs> uh, it's good to be with you. Um, I teach at Hanoi Bible College, which is not far away from here. We have a student house that's on the other side, uh, just not far away from here either. And so anyway, we're, we're actually quite close to uh, uh, HIF Westlake. A few weeks ago, I needed to take a taxi to go to Hanoi Bible College to teach a class. And so I did, you know, I, my motorbike was, somebody else was using it, so I, bar, I pulled out my phone and I opened the Grab app and requested a, a taxi. And right away, somebody accepted my request, so I was happy. But then he didn't move for the next five minutes. <laughs> and I'm, I'm normally a really patient guy with total strangers. Um, so here I am standing by the side of the road, uh, trying to bear witness to God's love for me by waiting for my grab driver. But after 10 minutes went by, I was done. So much for witnessing to God's love, I needed to go to class to teach the Bible to my students. So I canceled the booking and opened a new one. And what do you know, I got a, 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 a car right away. But it was the same driver. And so he texted me and he said, can you wait for five minutes? And I said, I wrote back and I said, I've already waited for 10. By now I was getting a bit agitated and my students were waiting. I had so much to, well, really important things to teach them. So I was losing my patience. Finally, the driver started moving. I thought, okay, uh, he's moving, I'll accept that. I'm glad I'm kind of slow in social situations. In my heart, I really wanted to give this driver an earful about how you don't take a customer while you're finishing your morning coffee. But it was the driver who gave me an earful. He got there and he was angry, but not at me. He had just dropped off a passenger and a traffic cop stopped him. Fined him 300,000 dong and he was mad about this. He couldn't even use complete sentences in Vietnamese. He was so angry, he kept blurting out the same things over and over. Show me your papers. Oh, 300,000 dong. I've never seen somebody so angry. At behind the wheel of a car. <laughs> what can you say to that? You know, I decided right away that his anger was a bigger deal than my anger, so I kept my mouth shut. We do live in a wicked world, don't we? I don't know if this taxi driver had broken the law, but he was angry because he felt that the cop was corrupt. I'm sure you can recall a situation in which you experienced or observed injustice, and it made you spitting mad. I remember one time my parents scolded me for throwing a baseball at my best friend's head. Why should I get in trouble? You know, he had a glove, he could have caught the ball. <laughs> but seriously, there are real injustices in the world, much more serious than a crossword from a parent or a $300,000 fine. A lot of things can be a spark that will set us off. It could be a news story or something in your Facebook feed, or something that a family member or a coworker or a friend does or says. This may not be an issue for you at the moment, but the time to prepare your heart for injustice is when things are going okay. So what can we do to respond to the injustices and inequities that make us spitting mad? That's a basic question for any disciple. And it is the beginning point of our, our series on suffering. This morning we are going to look at a psalm that seeks to answer just that question. So you could, if you have a Bible, you can open to Psalm 37. Psalm 37 is an alphabetic acrostic, meaning that just about every other verse starts with a new <coughs> letter in the order of the Hebrew alphabet. The most famous of these, I think there's about eight of them in the Psalms, the most famous is Psalm 119. You may be aware of this. It's an incredible poetic feat because that each set of eight verses begins with the same letter, beginning with the first letter and ending with the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So with 22 letters times eight, that's 172 verses. So now you know why Psalm 119 is so long. Now Psalm 37 is also fairly long, uh, but not quite as long as Psalm 118. Instead, it's more like a, it's also, it's not a prayer, like Psalm 119 is a prayer. Psalm 37 is actually a wisdom discourse. It's a lot like the Proverbs. 
So we can imagine this, these students sitting in uh, wisdom class uh, in David's palace, and they are really getting worked up about some un in injustice. And they're sharing, their uh, they're, they're sharing this with their wisdom teacher, maybe even David himself. Well, in response, the teacher offers perspective, advice, and hope. You might say that Psalm 37, let's see if we can get the, uh, if you can advance the slide for me. You might say that Psalm 37 teaches the ABCs, yeah, wrong button, that's why. User error, thanks. Uh, it teaches the ABCs of living in a wicked world. Uh, it's not the last word on suffering. But it's going to be the first word in our new sermon series, Beyond Band-Aids. And as we look at suffering, keep in mind that much of what we say is like preventative medicine uh, or preventative health measures, like sleeping enough, eating a good diet and exercising. Those things are not going to heal cancer or heart disease or whatever, but they can help prevent them or they can help lessen the effects. If you're in the midst of a hard times, a sermon is not likely to take care of it for you. It's a time to reach out to someone, to find loving community, because that's how God works to, to, to support us through hard times. But as we prepare to face hard times, Psalm 37 has a timely message for us. And we may summarize the message of the psalm in this way. In a wicked world, we trust the Lord and do good because we know he guarantees our future. This is the, sort of the main idea, I think, that encapsulates what the psalm is all about. Psalm is long and goes back over the same topics multiple times, so I'm not going to try to explain every verse. Instead, we will look at it from three perspectives, the ABCs, I want to call it. First, uh, we acknowledge the realities of our, our, our uh, world. The second, I'll talk about to be faithful to God. And third, count on God to be faithful. So we begin with A, acknowledge the realities of our world. This is what the Proverbs does. The wisdom literature in the Bible does a lot of making observations, almost like a scientist, a social scientist, if you will. First, we need to acknowledge our anger at injustice. The teacher begins not with the things going on around us, first of all. First of all, what's going on in our hearts. Three times the teacher says, fret not yourself. When a teacher recycles a phrase over and over again, we need to pay attention. So look with me in verses 1 to 2. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Again, in verses 7 to 9, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it only tends to evil, for the evildoers shall be cut off. Those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. This phrase, fret not yourself, it translates a Hebrew word that means to be hot. And in his book on the Psalms, uh, uh, Robert Alter uh, translates it this way. He says, do not be incensed. Now, if you don't incense, incense burns, right? He's trying to capture this idea of anger that's hot. And it's really clever because uh, it implies both fire and anger. Does anybody remember Yosemite Sam? Anybody who watched Looney Tunes? Yeah. yeah, so he's this old cartoon character. When he got angry, he would fume. I just can't resist putting a picture on the screen. You know, in our household, when one of us gets angry, sometimes we joke about the going, you know, like steam coming out of the ears, uh, just like Yosemite Sam. The teacher is saying, don't get all hot and bothered by the wicked. Why? The teacher gives two reasons. First, in verse 2, if you remember, they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. This is a theme that we will return to in a little while, but for now we just need to recognize that it makes no sense to get worked up over something that's going to be resolved in a short period of time. We cannot stop ourselves from getting angry, but we can manage our anger in light of the fact that sooner or later, God's going to deal with the wicked. Uh, second, in verse 8, the teacher remarks that when we get worked up, it only tends to evil. When was the last time you lost your cool and your anger helped solve your problem? I'm trying to, hard to remember the last time that worked for me. 
When we give into our anger, usually it leads us down the wrong path. We act impulsively, and that almost never ends well. This is especially true when the person that we are most upset about is a Christian. We need to take time to ask questions before we accuse. Find out the full picture before you act. Don't let your anger lead you down the same path as the one at whom you are angry. There is more to be said, and there are times to act in righteous outrage, right? <coughs> Jesus himself cleared the temple, and Esther acted judiciously when the existence of the, of the Jewish people was at risk in Persia. So there is a time to act. But when we are hot with anger, usually we make bad decisions. And the more we indulge our anger, the less we realize how we are controlled by it. That's why it's critical to acknowledge our anger and to resist its pull. Only then can we think clear, clearly to act wisely. So we admit the fragile reality of our own hearts, but then, second, we should acknowledge the real evil around us. So look, look at verse 12. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. Then in verse 14, the wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and needy, to slay those whose way is upright. Now, I'm a person who likes to think the best of other people. But there really are bad guys out there, aren't they? One of our students at the Bible College uh, shared a testimony. She was the victim of a relative who lured her to a place where she was kidnapped and taken to China. Uh, thankfully, she managed to escape. In the U.S., drug companies have put profit over wisdom when they started pushing opium-based painkillers for the last several decades. And now, United Americans are in a crisis where people are dying from opioid-related deaths. On the same token, though, the wisdom teacher remind us, reminds us that those bad guys often taste their own medicine. If you look at verse 15, which follows that word about the wicked, you know, drawing the sword and bending the bow to bring down the poor and needy, and this is what it says in verse 15, their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. This is similar to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 26, verse 52. All who take the sword will perish by the sword. Just like many wisdom sayings, this doesn't seek to account for every situation, does it? No doubt there have been mercenaries or gangsters who have lived to an old age and died a natural death. But if gang members are the quintessential bad guys, the likelihood of dying a violent death is high. According to an article by a former police officer involved in violence intervention, gang members in the United States have a life expectancy of 20 years and five months. And back to the drug companies, One Health News website reported a drug sales executive who had pressured doctors and nurses to prescribe opioids, and then he himself became addicted to those drugs. I even found a Yosemite Sam video, which I'm not going to share, but in which he aimed a cannon at Bugs Bunny but he didn't realize he was aiming his cannon down to the hull of his ship. And so when he fired that cannon, the, the ship sank. All this is to say that what Psalm 37 says about how the way the world works, often it fits our experience. There are real bad guys. And those bad guys often suffer the same fate that they deal out to others. But thirdly, we see the righteous flourish and the wicked languish. Look at verses 21 to 22. The wicked borrows but does not pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. But those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. This verse is such an interesting study in contrasts. Not only does it contrast the outcome for the righteous and the wicked, it contrasts what they are like, what kind of character they have. Those who borrow but do not pay back, they lack the, the character that would mean that they would pay their debts. But the righteous person has the money. Not only he gives, and he's generous, he gives. How is it that the righteous have money and the wicked do not? Now again, this doesn't seek to explain every case. There are poor people who are righteous. But the next verse explains in terms of God's covenant with Israel. The righteous inherit the land while the wicked are cut off. And this wording appears in several, several times in Psalm 37 and only one other place in the Bible, in the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 12, 29, and 19, verse 1, Moses tells Israel to expect God to cut off the wicked nations from the land, and that they would inherit the land. 
Now in Psalm 37, the wicked people in Israel faced the same fate as the wicked nations, that they would be cut off from the land that God had given to them. Why does this matter? None of us is, is, is uh, you know, living in the land of Israel, right? We need to understand the promises of Psalm 37 in light of God's overall plan for the ages. For Israel, the land was God's gift. It was a place where they could flourish in relationship with God. However, the New Testament reframes and, and redefines the role of place in God's plan in light of Christ. So no longer would God's people worship in one place. We don't worship in Jerusalem, right? The reality of, the, of that temple, it was just a, a, a pointing to the greater reality of Christ. With the coming of the Holy Spirit, the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's the place where God dwells among us. And furthermore, the gospel has gone out to the whole world. So the entire world is a place in which God's people may flourish. However, as it now stands, the God's place for his people is waiting to be renewed. As Romans chapter 8, verses 22 to 23 make plain. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. We are in an in-between time. When God has, has set up his kingdom, Jesus has come. He's gone up to the cross and been raised from the dead, declared with power to be the Son of God. And yet we're waiting for him to return and to consummate that kingdom, to establish a kingdom with no more suffering. Christ has died and was raised. He has applied that redemption to our hearts, and yet we wait. This means that we have to make sense of our struggles in this present wicked world in light of God's overall plan for history. We're going to come back to that later on. For now, acknowledging the realities of our wicked world requires, first of all, that we admit that we get angry, to be honest about the reason for that anger, that there's real bad guys, and recall that sooner or later the righteous flourish and the wicked languish, even if that may not be so for the moment. Once we acknowledge how things are, what should we do? That brings us to B, point B. We should be faithful. We've already covered one aspect of this. We should not let our anger control us and lead us down the pathway of evil. But the essential point the wisdom teacher wants to make is that we need to cultivate faith and faithfulness. Verses 3 to 4 summarize this well. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. First, the first line of verse 3 is really as straightforward as it sounds. You may be familiar with the old hymn, Trust and Obey, but there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's what this is saying. But there's a brilliant connection here between faith and obedience. In a wicked world, you have to trust God if you're going to obey, right? There are a whole lot of enticements not to obey. Think about all the immoral shortcuts you could uh, take in your business to get ahead, or the opportunities to take credit for what other people have done to advance your career, or maybe to get a better grade in school. We all know the enticements, but if you trust God to reward faithfulness, you will obey his word. The next line of verse 3 takes us into the imagination of a farmer. Now, in the ESV, the teacher uh, tells us to uh, dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. NIV has it slightly differently. The NIV says, enjoy safe pasture, which gets us closer to the poet's idea. The NASB, the New American Standard Bible, has what I think is, is the, the best. It's my, my preferred translation for this particular phrase. It's cultivate faithfulness. It's a good direct, direct translation of the phrase. The image of the poet is this. Tend faithfulness as you attend your sheep. Keep feeding faithfulness. Nurture it. Make it flourish in your life. Faithfulness does not come about by accident. Faithfulness is cultivated by consistent habit. From a negative perspective, Romans 8.13 describes it as putting to death the deeds of the flesh. So then, my brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. Since Jim Owen is here, I have to say that there was a 17th century English minister, John Owen, 
We wrote a whole book on this, almost on this verse. So how do we deal with sin in our life? Well, you have to put it to death. You have to kill it in your life. Cultivating faithfulness in our habits means putting to death those habits that would take us away from God's word. It said we rely on the Spirit to remake us with the guidance of His Word. Just as you may put to death the sin in you, you must cultivate faithfulness. None of us is an accidental Christian. And the reason is, before creation, God called you in His love to be His child. And He made it happen through the Gospel message that gripped your heart through the power of the Spirit. You are not an accidental Christian. So you cannot be an accidental disciple. We have to cultivate faithfulness through the means of grace, through gathering together as God's people every Sunday, through connect groups, through reading the Bible and praying on a a regular basis. But cultivating faithfulness is not merely about changing how we behave. Verse 4 shows us that cultivating faithfulness is about rightly ordering our desires. Let's look at that verse again. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you to the desires of your heart. This is a precious word that many have, have clung to over the years. Unfortunately, prosperity preachers love this verse, but they misinterpret it. The wrong way to interpret this verse is to say, as long as we go to church and we pray every day, God's going to give us what we want. Health, wealth, power, security, you name it. It's not really what it's talking about. It's not giving us a free pass to indulge in every desire that comes along. Instead, it's describing a reorientation of our desires. When our delight is in God, our delight, our desire is for Him. The connection, <clears throat> I'm sorry, our desire is for Him and He is happy to give us Himself. He gives us Himself freely. The connection between our delights and our behavior is really close. And I remember, uh, as I was preparing, what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus, Jesus is saying the same thing in reverse. Put your money into building the kingdom and it will transform your desires. The greatest desire that you will have will be for the kingdom. In a wicked world, we can be tempted to grasp for everything we can get, right? We know other people are trying to do the same. Uh, Whether it's the promotion at work, or the affection and respect of our friends, or maybe even the free time that you don't have to be responsible for those precious but demanding children, or whatever. It always feels like the world is a zero-sum game. There's only so much to go around, so we need to fight for what we want. That's the temptation. But there is something of more value than any kind of success achieved by human scheming. It's God himself. That's what the Apostle Paul concluded in Philippians chapter 3. After reviewing all the advantages of his upbringing as a Jew, Paul put it like this in chapter 3, starting at verse 7. But whatever I gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. There is one goal in life that surpasses all others. It's knowing Christ. Is your life ordered around that priority? Do you long to know Christ and faithfully make him known to others? How we order our lives says a lot about how we think about God and what we expect him to do. That brings us to the final point in our ABCs of living in a wicked world. Let us see, count on God to be faithful. This is about hope that God will act to reward those who follow him. We need to learn to think eschatologically. Now, I just dropped a $10,000 theological term. That's my prerogative as a theology teacher. (laughs) But, you know, let me explain it to you. This is a concept that you need to know. Uh, Eschatology is the study 
of God's plans for the end of history. That's, that's the quickest way I, I know how to explain it. It's the study of God's plans for the end of history. The Greek word eschaton means end, and the part ology comes from the word logos, which means word or study. We all know about the ologies in school. So, you know, there's biology, there's psychology, there's sociology. You can continue on and on. Eschatology is one of those ologies, except most universities don't study it. It's just, it, it's one of those ways that, it, you know, theologians like to talk about studying how God's going to wrap up history. Thinking eschatologically is thinking about the present in light of the future. In other words, godly hope is grounded in the plan of God. It's not grounded in a vague wish for some good to happen in the future. That's how often we often use that phrase, you know, I hope that grab taxi is going to come soon. It's a vague hope that something good is going to happen, right? But we hope in God's promises, revealed in his word. The first thing to count on is for God to vindicate those who keep his word. Again, another, that's maybe a $1,000 theological term. If you look at verses 5 to 6, you'll see what I mean. Vindicate, the word vindicate means that he will show his faithful ones to be right in the end. Look at verses 5 to 6 with me. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. We may be tempted to say, what good is there in following God's word if those guys who don't are doing so well? For the time being, we may not see it. But Christ is going to return and to judge the living and the dead. You cannot hide anything at noontime, can you? It's just too bright. Likewise, in the light of Christ's presence, no one will be able to hide their sin. Judgment is a fearsome thing, isn't it? But it is also a beautiful thing. Because without judgment, there is no justice. A victim receives no justice unless the perpetrator is judged. Whether God judges the wicked man himself or Christ in his place, there must be a judgment. In light of that future, we have hope that God will affirm and reward those who keep his word. Next, Psalm 37 describes the future God has for the righteous and the wicked. Several verses explain this idea, but uh, look with me at verses 27 to 29. Turn away from evil and do good, so, you shall, so shall you dwell forever. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. But the children of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. We should beware of thinking that this is automatic or it's just going to happen like that. If I can live a good life, I'll be blessed. We need to remember the context of this promise that I've already mentioned, which is God's covenant, his relationship, his, his agreement, almost like a contract with Israel. It's about relationship with God. Remember how I said that Deuteronomy first provided the language about the wicked being cut off and the righteous inheriting the land? Well, God had promised the land to Israel as a gift, and just like Deuteronomy predicted, Israel herself was cut off from the land because they, as a people, persisted in worshiping idols. God fulfills his promises with the long view in mind. He let Israel go on sinning against him for many generations. You think about their sin with the golden calf in the desert, or in the age of the judges, all the way down to those wicked kings in the book of Kings. It took a while to deal with Israel. But we don't inherit a land like they do, do we? So how does this relate to us? That's the question we need to answer. This promise has to be understood eschatologically. That is, we need to understand it in light of God's plan for the end of history. God chose Israel to be a picture. He called them to be a picture and a source of his blessing to the nations. They were supposed to take the good news about the Lord to the nations, but they failed to do so. And they failed to be faithful to him and to be his holy nation. And so they were sent into exile. And that, in that way, God showed that in history, only he is the one who is faithful to the end. Well then... He sent his son Jesus, and Jesus was the true Israel. He went out into the desert for 40 days, you remember, just like Israel was 40 years in the wilderness, except Jesus was faithful. And to bring, he sent Jesus to bring blessing to the nations through his suffering on the cross and his resurrection, that blessing that is now applied to us by faith. Likewise, God chose the church. 
to bring that blessing to the nations by bearing witness to Jesus. And that calling requires suffering. As Paul makes clear in Colossians 1, that how he's filling up what was lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Right now, we have every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly places. And God still cares for our physical needs, but God is gathering a people from every people and nation into his church. It's lovely. We have a picture of that in HIF. That's a picture of the future when Jesus will return to judge to gather his church and to establish a new creation, a new Jerusalem, where he will put an end to all suffering. No more death, no more cancer, no more injustice, no more crying, no more pain. In this life, we may expect to suffer, as Jesus promised to us in John chapter 16, verse 33. But a glorious future in the new creation awaits those who follow Christ. The promises to Israel were a bit like a, a partial picture of the promises of the peace in the new creation. God's promises were perfect, but Israel's sin kept them from experiencing the peace and prosperity that God had promised. All of that was to point forward to Christ, who alone could put things right and bring a kingdom of peace. We interpret our present experience in light of God's plan, because the plan gives us a sure hope for the future, as well as a proper expectation for today. There are two ways that we can kind of go off the rails or kind of fail to make sense of suffering and hope. On the one hand, without an, without an awareness of God's plan, we can live without hope. We can despair of any relief from suffering. Despair is not from God. It is one of the lies that Satan would use to keep us from flourishing in God's love. On the other hand, we can put God's we can put promises in God's mouth that He never promised us. I once heard an African American preacher say something in response to a false understanding of God's promises. It's not in the contract, and that's such a beautiful way of putting it. There are some things that we expect that are not in the contract. So when we, they don't happen, we get upset. We need to remember what the contract is. Sometimes people want to claim new creation blessings today. Prosperity preaching has done much harm in giving people the idea that God promises we can be healthy and wealthy today if we just believe. It's a lie. Yes, God wants us to be healthy and at peace. That's true. But we're still on mission in the midst of a wicked world, and that involves suffering. God delays his judgment because of his mercy to bring many to him. And so we still get sick, and we still die. But we still proclaim the gospel until Christ returns. We suffer in the hope of the resurrection that one day we will have new bodies. We count on God because he is trustworthy. He entered our suffering in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus endured the ultimate injustice in a sinless, as a sinless man who was punished to redeem us because of our sin, to redeem us from death. And he rose from the dead, giving us a hope that one day God will raise us from the dead. So whatever injustice we may see today, we can count on God to put it right in his time and in his way. Psalm 37 gives us a timely message that in a wicked world, we trust the Lord and do good because we know he guarantees our future. We need to acknowledge the realities of our world. We need to be faithful to God. and We need to count on God to be faithful. So what makes you angry? What makes you fume like Yosemite Sam? Entrust these things to God. In Hanoi, we have to endure a long summer, don't we? You know, even into October, we long for relief. We're still running air conditioners. We want that relief, you know, as, as we long for the relief that is coming from the wickedness around us and even in us. God's word of hope about the future is like the cool breeze on a sunny day in November. We know that day is coming. And unlike that breeze on that beautiful, cool day in Hanoi, which happens about three times a year and is gone, <laughs> the kingdom of God will last forever. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we thank you for your word because we know that whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. God of endurance and encouragement, we need your grace to have faith and to be faithful to you in the midst of a world that does not honor you. 
Help us to do what is good and to cultivate faithfulness. We trust that you will act. And as the God of hope, would you grant us to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together we may with one voice glorify God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For it is in his name that we pray, and in his name that we hope. Let us prepare our hearts uh, to give an offering. Uh, earlier, Daniel mentioned uh, that Jesus said that we uh, can invest in the kingdom. And that's a choice that we make. That's actually a choice that's countercultural. Why would, should we give from our money if we worked hard for it? And we can actually buy a new phone or get a better career or move to another city. Why give up from what God has given us? But it's that investment into the kingdom uh, that really blesses us. Jesus said, give and you will receive. We don't give so we can receive more money. No, we give so we can receive more of the kingdom. So let us prepare our hearts to give our offering. Lord, we thank you for this encouraging word this morning. There's a lot of meat to chew on, a lot of truth to process. The one truth is that you are faithful. The scripture shows that you are the only faithful. Even when we are unfaithful, you cannot be unfaithful to us because you can never deny yourself. You are a faithful God. We thank you for that faithfulness and that that's shown in our lives by all the provisions that you have given us. And so we give because we have already received. And we give from what you have given us. So we give because we are so blessed. And we give out of joy and out of cheer and out of gratefulness and out of thanks. And Lord, may we, what we sow and what we give, indeed further your kingdom in this city and among the nations, we pray in Jesus' name.
Savior and my God. Christ my Savior and my God. You stood before Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. Listen to this promise, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, 
and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Let's give him glory. Thank you, Lord, for the promise. We thank you for the promise, Lord. We have this hope in the midst of suffering. Thank you, Jesus. I want to invite our prayer partners to come up front if you would like to receive prayer. Whether you are facing struggles, suffering today, or perhaps on behalf of someone else you know, they would love to pray with you. Uh, today we have some guests from uh, North Carolina. Uh, Tom Mullis in particular, he is experienced in citywide networks. And so if you're interested in learning more about citywide networks, how Love Hanoi and Love in Action and citywide networks can bless our city, you're welcome to speak to him and join us for lunch after service. God bless you and have a wonderful time. Baptism at 12 o'clock. So we're baptizing the father-in-law of Sheila Chun, who is a member of our congregation. And so that will be a special occasion, 12 o'clock baptism and lunch afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.